Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. And this story is one of, about one of the most interesting characters that I've run across here uh, that lived in Central Florida. His name was Trapper Nelson, also known as the Wild Man of the Loxahatchee. And here you see me uh, filming as we're coming up to his camp because by the way, he was uh, about nine miles inland if you go by water and the only way to access it right now is to take a boat and go up the river the Loxahatchee to see his camp uh, and I'll get more into you know the information about his life and the mysterious circumstances of his death and also of course the ghost reveal but even if there was no ghostly uh, information about uh, Trapper Nelson he was such an interesting extraordinary person that just as life story in and of itself is really really riveting and you're gonna see me in a minute I'm going to do like a real quick run through the camp and that happened because well, we were taking the tour and I was listening to the tour guide I was under the impression that they were gonna let us go back and just walk around that turned out that wasn't the case and so I had to just quickly go through all those spots that I had just gone through a minute ago while I was listening to what the tour guide was saying. Here, this area right here, like this eating area, this is where they found his body in 1968 with a gunshot wound to the stomach, which they later determined uh, was a suicide. Uh, he had been out here a week by the time they found him. And this table here is where they decided to do an autopsy. Because as you can imagine, between the heat, animals, insects, after a week, what was left of him well, they decided to go ahead and do the autopsy there. That eating area, at one time he used to entertain people, he used to have tours, uh, and he built that, you know, so that people could actually have a good time. However, by the time he died, he had become a recluse. Uh, you had to uh, either let him know ahead of time, even if you were his friend, that you were going to come up to see him. Otherwise, he would not receive you, and he... By that time, he would walk around with a 12-gauge shotgun. Uh, here, they uh, have some pictures, which I'm going to show you later on, about what he looked like during his lifetime. He was uh, he was a very good-looking man, and unfortunately, when he died, he wasn't that old. And that's what lends an air of mystery as to the reason of his death. Was it a suicide? Was it murder? And back here, this... This is a second cabin that he built for himself uh, with a lot of the amenities. He built all of this uh, by his lonesome because eventually what he did with the first one that he had was he started to rent it out. And in that fireplace right there, a few years after his death, some rangers found a quite a large amount of coins that he had stashed. And uh, here I am walking along outside. And during this last hurricane of Irma, one of the rangers that has a trailer out there when things got really crazy, he ran in here and he took cover in that cabin. And there it is. And it, you could tell there's even parts where he would notch which of the hurricanes he had gone through while he was staying uh, out here in his homestead. And all these cords of woods, that's how he would keep in shape. He would cut these cords of wood for his own use and also because at one point he would receive a lot of socialites and stars and these people would bring their own cooks and they would cook. So that's how he kept in shape. This is the original cabin that he lived at and that eventually he turned around and made money from it by um, by renting it out. Trailing behind me somewhere, you probably saw Henry in a yellow shirt saying, what are you doing? They're going to leave us, which by the way, they almost did. But I wasn't going to leave without getting some uh, some of these shots. And over there you saw a Jeep, which uh, is what he used. This is like a remake. It's like only the original axle and stuff is what was his. And he that's what he used to get around and deliver his pets, pelts and go into Jupiter and trade. Over there you see these bathrooms, which by the way, he also built himself because at some point... The health department told them, if you're going to have people out here, you need to have bathrooms. And there's still work, by the way. And s these are some of the pits of the alligators he used to keep. Because he used to have like a petting zoo and he would take tours. He would sell fruits. He would have fruit trees. This gentleman was quite an entrepreneur. And 
Just wait till you hear his story. It is something else. The Legend of Trapper John Between Hobie Sound and Tequesta, Florida, lies Jonathan Dickinson State Park. This historic 11,500-acre site located in Martin County was named after Jonathan Dickinson, a Quaker merchant who was shipwrecked in 1696 with his family and others on the Florida coast near the present-day park. However, Vince Trapper Nelson's story started far away in another state. He was born in either 1908 or 1909 to poor Polish parents in Trenton, New Jersey, although there has been mentioned that his background was Russian. Same thing with his birth name. Uh, one version is his name is Vincent Natokowicz or Nastakovich. Really difficult to pronounce, and you can see why he eventually... Uh, anglicized it to Nelson. Uh, while still a teenager, in order to escape an unhappy home life after his widowed father remarried, he left home with his stepbrother Charles and they hoboed across the United States riding the freight trains out west. They ended up in Mexico and were jailed for allegedly gun running but were eventually freed. They took to the rails again and Nelson made money by gambling with the other bums. By the 1920s, they stopped their wandering and set up camp in an area just north of Jupiter. By then, his brother and him had changed their difficult to pronounce surname to Nelson. Vince Nelson and his stepbrother Charles and a friend, John Dykus, who was also from Trenton, hunted and trapped animals. However, this partnership came to an abrupt end on December 17, 1931, when Charles Nelson shot John Dykus in the back with a shotgun after an argument over money. After the murder, Charles left a note for Vince, who was attending to his traps, and turned himself in at the police station in West Palm Beach. Trapper ended up testifying against his brother, even though he was absent when the murder took place. He testified that Charles and John Dykus had argued various times before over money. Charlie was sentenced to life imprisonment at Rayford Prison by Judge C. E. Chillingworth. He was paroled in the 1950s just in time to be briefly considered a suspect in the killing of Judge Chillingworth, who it turned out was killed by the henchmen of another judge. The reason he became a suspect was on the day he was sentenced, he threatened to come back and kill Trapper and the judge. After Charlie's conviction, Trapper, who was 24 years old, found himself without money and partners. He went back to Trenton and worked at a dairy farm, but after one year, he returned to Jupiter. He retreated deeper into the woods and kept trapping animals and selling furs and pelts. He took over an abandoned hunter's cabin, which sat on land which could only be accessed by boating up the river. In 1934, uh, he debuted in the boxing ring in West Palm Beach, no doubt trying to make money that way. He was six foot four and weighed about 200 pounds, and he participated in the heavyweight division. In 1938, uh, he was having a feud with a neighbor uh, over there in the wilderness by the name of H.J. Miller, who lived in Kitchen Creek, and uh, around that time, someone dynamited 16 goats that Miller had, and Nelson was arrested for it. But after hiring a lawyer, the case was dismissed against him. It was uh, also during this time, which was when the Depression had hit the United States, that he was able to buy large tracts of acreage, which went up for sale at tax auctions. Uh, Tourists from West Palm Beach eventually wound up at his camp, and initially he showed visitors around for free, but realizing there was money to be made, he started Trapper Nelson's camp, where he sold souvenirs and let the visitors see all the wildlife he kept caged on the grounds. During this time, he lived a frontier life without any running water or electricity and eating the animals he trapped. However, he knew that tourists would appreciate some niceties, and he set up picnic tables, cabins, and grills. And he became quite a celebrity known as the Wild Man of the Loxahatchee, or the Tarzan of the Loxahatchee. And his zoo became a regular stop for tour boats. Movie stars including Gary Cooper made a stop at Trapper Nelson's camp. 
Uh, he also romanced all the West Palm Beach socialites who were smitten with a strapping wild man who wrestled alligators. War raged in Europe during those years of the 1930s. However, when the United States entered into World War II, it got in the way of his best laid plans. And in 1942, he married a waitress by the name of Lucille Guy to avoid the draft, which didn't work because he was drafted anyway. After tearing a leg muscle while training in Texas, he returned to Florida and found Lucille was cheating on him with an officer from the nearby Camp Murphy, where he ended up serving as an MP and getting into trouble because he wanted to patrol wearing a cutoff shorts uh, version of the uniform. It's believed that some of the movers and shakers of the area had pulled some strings to get him posted close to his home. Uh, Nelson went on to divorce Lucille after she had run off, and she went on to marry four more times. Uh, however, it came back to haunt him when he did a DIY, a do-it-yourself divorce proceedings, uh, which ended up not legally divorcing them, and she came back and sued for property, which she got. Uh, by the 1950s, Trapper Nelson had bought more land, but had also grown more mistrustful of strangers and the government. Health inspectors insisted that he had to install bathrooms at the camp, and he did so, but not to the satisfaction of the inspector, who in 1960 forced him to close his zoo. Uh, prior to that, uh, he had a boy who had gotten injured on a rope swing. He got sued by the parents, uh, which also raised from the specter of that this could happen again, and he could get sued once more by someone else touring the zoo, the campsite. So what happened was once he was closed down by the health department, his source of income dried up and he was forced to borrow money and to pay the taxes on the land he owed. And he just discouraged visitors coming to the camp and posted signs warning them away as well. And he took up carrying a 12 gauge shotgun with him. In 1965, he sold about 80 acres for over $300,000 uh, but he still held land and control of the upper reaches of the northwest fork of the river. Uh, what he did was he fell some of the trees across the river, thereby stopping anyone by boat. Many people suspect that um, Nelson, who it seems was quite handy with dynamite, uh, that's what he used to fell these large trees so that no boats could come up. And even his friends... Uh, who had known him for many years, had to let him know ahead of time that they would be visiting otherwise. They could only see him once per week uh, when he came into town to pick up mail at the post office. Um, it was also during these years that he developed stomach pains. Uh, but his distrust also extended to physicians, and he wouldn't go seek out medical help. In July of 1968, after he failed to show up for a meeting with a good friend of his, John Dubois, who owned a fishing camp uh, out in Jupiter. Uh, John decided to come to the camp and he found Trapper dead from a shotgun blast to his stomach area. Now there's different accounts of where he was shot. Uh, in one version published by one of the newspapers, Dubois found him on his back and he had a hole in the back of his head and he appeared to have killed himself by putting the shotgun in his mouth. Uh, but there's more prevalent accounts where he shot himself in either the chest or the stomach area and was found face downward in one of those picnic areas and the shotgun was close by. Um, part of the reason um, that it was eventually ruled a suicide by the coroner's jury, jury is that uh, Nelson had convinced himself, despite medical opinions to the contrary, that he was suffering from cancer, uh, maybe because he had stomach pains. Uh, however, uh, even after it was ruled a suicide, which is about two weeks after his death, the locals uh, who had lived in that area and had known him for many years felt dismayed that foul play was so easily dismissed. He had other trappers he didn't get along with. Uh, there were others who wanted his land. In other words, he had enemies. Um, he also had trespassers that would come on the property and that he would have to chase off. Before his death, he would even vary the days that he would come into town, afraid someone would realize what his routine was and vandalize his campsite. Um, 
He didn't have any money troubles, contrary to what sometimes they say that he owed money. No, he didn't have any money troubles, apparently with that sale of acres that he had before. He settled all his debts. He had about close to $90,000 in the banks and was working on a deal to sell the land that would have made him an actual millionaire and not just one on paper based on the property owned along the Loxahatchee. Uh, again, in other words, there's more reasons for murder than for suicide. Uh, one week after his death, uh, his nephew and other family members came down from Trenton, New Jersey, and they scattered his ashes on the waters of the Loxahatchee River as he had requested in his will. In 1968, uh, he had committed suicide, and it was, I believe, July of 1968. Within days, his campsite was being ransacked, some mostly to look for the belief that he had hidden money somewhere in the campsite. Part of this came back because sometimes when he would be having poker games there and he needed some extra money, he would leave and come back, and some of the money was covered um, with dirt. Other, another time there was another story where he went into one of the local banks in Jupiter with a burlap sack full of money and some of the money had dirt on it and he had uh, almost $70,000 um, and he he uh, he got upset when the banker was telling him where he had to basically since his deposit was over $10,000 he would have to fill out all these forms and a bunch of things going on and he just got mad and took his burlap sack full of money and left. Nobody knows what he did with that money. So of course, within hours, of, you know, there were people running around on the campsite and it was so uh, remote that there was nobody out there to oversee it. Uh, by 1969, uh, the, 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 the government finally got around to posting no trespassing signs due to the amount of vandalism uh, that they had been done also to several of the buildings and agents of the Game and Fresh Waterfish Commission were ordered to prosecute anyone caught on the land. Much of the trespassing, uh, in other words, even though there were people, the worst had already been done. And also at this time, the state looked like they were going to end up with uh, those 800 and something acres that he owned and also thought was being given to eventually do what they did was to, which was to turn the campsite into some type of uh, museum, something that visitors to the park could go to. Uh, eventually, in 1970, the state of Florida paid $1.3 million to his nephew in order to purchase 850 acres of his properties and then added to the Jonathan Dickinson State Park. Now, this is where we get to the ghost reveal. As you could tell, this guy <laughs> had quite an adventurous life. I'm sure there was a lot of things he did which were never documented, but uh, he was an entrepreneur. He was an adventurer. Uh, so it's not surprising when you hear stories that maybe because also the circumstances of his death, he is not ready to just uh, paddle on a canoe out into the sunset. So like many ghost stories, it's really hard to pinpoint when paranormal activity activities actually experienced by the living you know, when it starts, but it's even more difficult when the location is a secluded state park. Uh, in 1994, a female park ranger said that she didn't see anything but heard him trying to flirt with her and that he patted her on the rear. Other female rangers have also had encounters with Trapper Nelson, whether if it's not a full body apparition, um, they kind of feel his presence that, in other words, he's flirting away as he did in life. Um, Two men uh, who canoed to Trapper's cabin were struck by an unseen person and others have claimed to see him waving from the dock of his encampment. Uh, caretakers who have stayed there for long periods of time at the campsite and while they're working there and cleaning things up, they have very felt his presence very, very strongly on various occasions. Rose, who's a local resident from the area, lives on the dirt road which Trapper would use when he would come in for supplies and claims that she has seen him several times. And she would know because as a small child, when she would accompany her brother who was 20 years older than her to visit Trapper. And she claims that she sees Trapper outside the, the, the rear sliding glass door of her home, trying to look in through the glass. And 
She's also heard the sound of footsteps on the path he used when coming in for supplies. Uh, other witnesses claim that Trapper John's ghost points a finger at his brother Charlie as his killer. Uh, others describe where he warns visitors away from the Native American burial grounds. From what I understand, there was a couple, as a matter of fact, two Native American uh, burials that he was aware of. And there was a rumor also that at some point he, in other words, he didn't want them to be desecrated. Uh, campers describe inexplicable noises from the underbrush as if someone is walking through it and the sound of faraway voices. And this has happened close to the trapper's old cabin. You can't camp directly at that campsite, but undoubtedly if you're a camper and you're staying out in the regular, the camping part of the park, you know, you would, this is the one spot everybody goes to. Or you can canoe up to, uh, to the campsite. Uh, throughout the years after his death, uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of people that have had paranormal experience, which they just couldn't account for, but they decide just not to talk about it, especially if they got a good scare. So for all these stories that we hear about, I bet you there's 10 times over experiences, whether they were seen or heard, felt that people just do not say anything about. Uh, now, it's also important to remember that the area where Trapper John lived on also had its own rich history, such as the Battle of Jupiter Inlet, which occurred on January 15th of 1838 between the Spanish Seminoles, the Seminole Negro, and the United States Navy, which could cast another layer of ghostly encounters. Also, um, in 1940, there was a man who was found dead in his car. He had committed suicide by putting a hose into his closed vehicles, and he was poisoned by carbon monoxide fumes. Um, and he had chosen a lonely stretch of road that was not far from Trapper Nelson's camp. Uh, also throughout the years, there were various canoers that ended up drowning in the Loxahatchee River. Uh, that could also be some of those uh, unquiet spirits that sometimes are just confused as to what to do next. Now, undoubtedly, at the center of this cast of characters is Trapper Nelson. And it takes no stretch of the imagination that this campsite that he carved out of the wilderness and where he lived for so many years would be where he would make his presence known most often. But there are other spirits on the periphery of that camp that look at present day tourists as they walk around the campsite, wondering if they will be seen or heard and if someone will tell them what happened and where they need to go to now. So when you hear noises in the underbrush, you might be surprised to know that these spirits might even be here long before Trapper Nelson came and that he himself heard them when he lay alone in his bed in the still of the night when all became suddenly quiet. And as brave as he was, he knew that it was no animal that had come into his camp and that it was no human either, a living one, that is.